Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. It's been quite a journey as we covered the book of Revelation. So in this timeline, it is the tribulation. And the tribulation, we're going to see a lot of things what the Apostle John is talking about. Over here, we see the entire church age era right here. So this is the church age. And throughout this church age era, we have seen seven different churches that the Lord has uh, explained in his passage. So the first one is Ephesus right here. Over here is Smyrna. Over here is uh, Pergamos. Over here is Thyatira. Over here is Sardis. Over here is Philadelphia. And Philadelphia covered the centuries of either 1500 to 1900 or from 1700 to 1900. That was the key day and age, the Great Awakening revivals. Lastly, we are right here, which is the crowning age of apostasy, Laodicea, Laodicea. So right here, we covered the first centuries over here. And then right here is covering the latter, earlier centuries. Then over here, it covers the time of Constantine. Then over here, it covers the time of the medieval era and the early Reformation. This one is covering around the Reformation era. This one is the Great Awakening era. This one is the modern era. Laodicea is quite a day and age where you see a lot of action happening. Laodicea is the day and age where the Catholic Church made an amazing comeback and then revived its system. Philadelphia had no place whatsoever. During the day of Philadelphia, that's when the elites, the big conspiracies that you hear about today of the systems, the bankers and all that, that's when it was born. It was at Philadelphia. Why? Because they had to do it underground. In public, preachers and churches were dominating the world. They didn't have the guts to come out that time. So it was all underground. Because of this underground system from the elites and conspiracies, what happens is then it started to affect the spiritual state, where they first attacked your Bible, introduced evolution. Through that means then Laodicea successfully kicked in. So that's why you got the big power plays today who control our world, and the church has fallen into apostasy, and then the world becoming more socialist, more liberal-minded, more about civil rights. Remember, that's what Laodicea means. It means civil rights. It covers the ages of 1900 to the end. What is different about Laodicea compared to the different eras is that Sardis was definitely dead. Philadelphia was hot. These, uh, Thyatira and Pergamos, was a great day of darkness and apostasy. But Laodicea, what made it very different is that it is hot and cold, which God hates the most. Why is that? The reason why is this, is because when you're watching some preacher online or you attend some church, see, it's getting hot. And you're like, man, this is the right guy. And then you hear something where they slip up in and then they're like cold. And then you can't, and that's why you're all confused. I don't know if this preacher is right or wrong. Am I wrong? Yeah. yeah. How many of you have been searching for Bible-believing truth and you ended up like that? So that's, what, that's why God hates this day and age the most. Why? Because people can't make up their mind. They can't see if they're dead or if they're in the right. Because you think that the preacher's a good guy because he shook your hand. He preached a good sermon. But then all of a sudden, then he goes cold in some area. That's churches today. And God hates that the most. He would prefer you to be dead and cold. That way he can know, okay, so you're done. But if you're like hot, 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 then the God, God is like, okay, I'm going to use you. And then you become cold in something. God's like, I can't use you then. Well, then what am I going to have to do? I have to just sit back and still see. And it's still that process. That's why God hates that the most. He would prefer you to be dead and cold so that he can move on to the next person. Okay, so let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. 
as many as I love, so God loves these people, the Laodiceans, I rebuke and chasten. That's why God has to rebuke them. That's why God has to judge them. So chasten, that's an old English word where it means like discipline. It can even mean scourging sometimes, believe it or not, at Hebrews chapter 12. So it's like beating you. So God has to beat the senses into you. Thus, what? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's why you should be zealous about your apostate state, right? For example, you were like this from January to May, and then all of a sudden at summer camp, you became zealous and repented, right? <clears throat> so that's what God wants, is that basically there's got to be some point in your life that you become zealous Hey, I want to quit this. I want to get right with God. I got pumped up after the singing and the preaching and the fellowship. So I'm going to get right with God. So God wants that. All right, let's look at verse 20. Behold, so behold is occasionally used by God. Jesus would say that quite a few times. What does that mean, Pastor? Behold means pay attention. <laughs> so there are people who just go, uh-huh, uh-huh, amen. Amen. But they're not really paying attention. So that's why God, instead of just preaching, a lot of times he'll say, behold, and then speak. Why? Because he wants your attention. Yeah. Sometimes, you notice back in my older videos, I would say the word see a lot. The reason why I say that is because I'm trying to draw in your attention. See? 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 You see that? You know? Why would I say that? Because that way you can get it. Oh, now I see it. You know? I'm paying attention right here. But then I just realized how redundant it sounds, so I cut that off a lot. But that's the same idea that God wants. So he's saying, behold. So you'll see that. I stand at the door and knock. Ah, then Laodicea, it's a closed door. So it's a closed door. And then the Lord Jesus Christ right here is knocking. He's trying to go in, but he can't. Here you are being hot and cold and just going like this. It's going like this. Mm -hmm. What is Philadelphia, though? Remember Philadelphia? Look at the previous yeah. verses. Look at verse 8. I have set thee before thee and what? Open door. Philadelphia right here, the door was open. Because it was open, Jesus can move inside and then start sweeping revival. Laodicea, what it did is that it became a closed door. But we love Jesus. Uh-huh. We sing hymns. Uh-huh. We try to win souls. Uh-huh. We're against the uh, left-wing movement. Uh-huh. We stand against abortion. Uh-huh. We use the NIV. See that? We use the ESV. Well, let's put in worldly music into our church. Let's put in worldly dressing into our church. Hey, you know, the preaching, uh, you don't have to mention hell and sin all the time. See, this is what God hates. Yeah. See, this, uh, 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 make up your mind. Yeah. When you come to this church, you know where I stand. All right? I don't play tiddly winks with you. Yeah. You know after you hear the first sermon, okay, I know what this guy's going to be like in his preaching and teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? That's just me. So that's why when people walk out and they don't come back to church, you know why? Because they know where I'm at, see? They know where I'm at right here. So this is a church of an open door where God can move in. But Laodicea, they're closed. So it doesn't matter how much you love Jesus, how much service you're doing for him. If there's that cold that's pulling it back, that's enough to make it a closed door. So remember that. Look, the pastor may be even more sincere in intentions than me. I really believe that. I really believe there are pastors in this area who have more sincere intentions than I do. And perhaps even love Jesus more than I do. I can go for that. But here's the problem. It doesn't matter how you're looking at their good points. What about their apostasy, their wrong doctrines, their wrong practices? See, that's enough to make it a closed door and God can't bless it. Besides, if you're truly sincere in your intention, you're not going to have anything cold in your life. Okay, so Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking. They're not letting him in. If any man hear my voice, so look at that. They're not even hearing him. 
So you got to realize this. It doesn't matter how many chapters of the Bible they read or they prayed or how many sermons they preach or they claim, I saw Jesus in a vision. I dreamed about Jesus. God spoke to me to say this. No, God did not speak to you anything, man. You can't even hear his voice. Why? Because, see that? Cold. If you're hot and cold, you're not listening to him. How do you know that I'm not listening to him? I sure listen to him. Okay, you want to bet? Yeah, I want to bet. All right. Signs and wonders are not biblical. They're of the devil. Oh, how dare you say that? See, you're not listening. That's the problem with people. They have a defense mechanism where they rationalize things and they want to go in their own world. See, on my side of the door. They refuse to be open-minded, open-hearted where God is speaking. Okay, you know that signs and wonder charismatic doctrine is wrong. You know those modern versions are wrong. You know that worldly music is wrong. You're not letting him in. You have your own Jesus, your own Christianity. Jesus is outside saying, knock, knock, let me in. Okay. If any man hear my voice and open the door, so come on and open the door. Be like Philadelphia. Okay, why is it in your blowout services you get people running around the aisle? We want to be like Philadelphia. Open the door. It's not we're all going to be tight and restricted here. Why is it that the preacher had to preach that hard? He, could, he didn't have to yell that. Because open the door. You want to open the door. Oh, I don't like how people come down on the altar. It feels like I'm being pressured to come. Open the door. The door. Amen. See, why, what's the matter? You're being Laodicea. Yeah. You're not opening like Philadelphia. I want you to be a missionary. Well, you know, uh, Lord, I got my job, I got my wife, and I got my children, and I got this problem. Open the door. The missionaries, they said, Lord, I surrender all, and they went. Is that conviction I feel? I'm feeling something here. Okay, so let's keep reading. I will come into him. So Jesus Christ can finally come inside you and will sup with him so he can eat with you and he with me and you can eat with him. Now, there's a thing where we spiritually feast with Jesus Christ. Bible reading and prayer is where you intake spiritual food, correct? But see, how can God <clears throat> give you spiritual food to eat? So here Jesus is with his spiritual food and spiritual walk. He wants to talk to you, right? He wants to walk with you. He has it here, but you're not letting him in. That's your problem. So because you refuse to let him in, that's why your spiritual life is stunted. Your spiritual walk is stunted. And that's why you, when you see majority of the churches in this Silicon Valley area, San Francisco Bay Area, they're not spiritually growing even though they claim they love Jesus because there's a cold draft that's pulling them back as well. You know why? There's something they're closing the door on. Jesus says, let me in so that you can finally eat with me, grow in grace with me. Now, what's interesting right here is that when we go back to our main text at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, remember the doctrine that I talked to you about? God, Jesus Christ, he has the key of David, right? So Jesus Christ has the key of David right here. So because he has the key of David, this key of David, if you remember, has to do with David's house. To a saved Christian, what that means is that joining David's uh, kingly rulership in his spiritual line, spiritual family. So in other words, saved Christians are spiritual Jews. Jesus Christ comes from this spiritual line of David. He has the key to open that and let you in. When you receive Jesus Christ for your salvation, you became part of the spiritual, not physical, spiritual house of David. That was for saved Christians. For Jews and tribulation Jews, what that was is joining David's physical rulership, physical kingdom at the millennium. That was the house. Christians, on the other hand, it was a spiritual kingdom joining the spiritual generation of David, of Jesus Christ. 
That's why we're called born again, new birth. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. Why is that? Because it's talking about a spiritual generation, spiritual line that the Christians are a part of. Okay, now what's interesting is this, is that Jesus Christ opened the door for you, Laodicean, to get in here, but you refused to let Jesus Christ inside your life, your house. That's telling, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that God would let us wicked sinners inside his house, but we don't let him inside our house? Mm, yeah. That'll preach right there. Yeah. That'll preach hard right there. Yeah. I can preach a whole sermon on that. You got a problem, man. And if I, if I were you right here, I'm going to look at this, contemplate on it, be serious, get right with God on that one. Otherwise, you're going to be a layout to say it. It's amazing that we shut the door to God, but God opens the door to us. All right, let's look at verse 21. So a tribulation phrase again, right? To him that overcometh. So if you overcome, so overcome, conquer, you live your life well, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? Jesus Christ will grant you access to sit with him on his throne. So you're going to share his rulership with him. You get a chance to sit on his throne and rule. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. That means Jesus Christ overcame too. Jesus Christ conquered in his life. That's why he's able to sit on the throne to rule. So remember the tribulation doctrine from all the previous verses we looked at. A tribulation saint, if he lives his life overcoming... The Antichrist evil system right here, if he overcomes this, then what? That's why he can have access to the throne right here. So he's got to overcome that. He's got to go through this. That's why it makes so much sense. The Bible says endure to the end to be saved for tribulation saints. And the Bible says here is the patience of the saints. At Revelation 14. It makes so much sense. Yeah. You have to overcome. That's a tribulation context right here. If we're also going to see a tribulation context from the previous two verses, 19 and 20, the tribulation doctrinal application could be that because the tribulation saint is lukewarm, he's not hot and cold, then what this means is that it could be a salvation context. They're not allowing the Holy Spirit Jesus to enter into them. Without Jesus in their hearts, then what? They're not sealed. They're not secured right here in their salvation. Uh, you hear the phrase, I ask Jesus inside my heart, right? That phrase is actually taken from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. So that's a famous verse Christians use when we do soul winning. Did you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life? Now that's okay to do. If a spiritual context, because remember, there's always two contexts, doctrinal and spiritual. In a spiritual context, you can do that at verse 20. I see it more as a different spiritual context where it's like you're refusing to let Jesus Christ in your life where you can grow in grace. But it doesn't matter right here. We could see it as salvation or we could see it as spiritual growth for a Christian right here if they refuse to let Jesus Christ inside them. But from a tribulation, doctrinal application, what we can see right here is that this could be a salvation thing where it has to do with overcoming at verse 21. So unless you overcome everything in your life, you can finally let surrender all and let Jesus inside your heart. So that's a tribulation doctrinal context if we're going to include verse 21. If we're going to make it a spiritual application, a Christian context, then verse 20 to 21 would be that verse 21, you overcome, why? Because of faith in Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 5, remember that. So because of that, that's why we say at verse 20, did you invite Jesus Christ inside your heart? Meaning, did you receive him by faith, trust in him by faith? So we can see both spiritual and doctrinal applications right here. All right, now uh, let's, first, let's look at verse 22. All right, what am I going to ask? You all got ears? Yeah. All right, if you got ears, he that hath an ear, then what? Please, please, for crying out loud, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
So the Holy Spirit, we've seen, let's look at this from a spiritual context. The Holy Spirit, ever since the time of the apostles, right, the Holy Spirit was sent down, correct? When the Holy Spirit came down, what's so amazing is that he's been speaking to all the churches, the entire church age right here. And it's so amazing how much the church did not pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is speaking. We've seen that in all seven church eras. And it seems like churches don't learn their lesson. As one big preacher said, uh, what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. That's a problem with us wicked, fleshy, carnal Christians, is that we just don't seem to learn our lessons right here. Now we've hit that stage where, okay, okay, I learned my lesson, but no, it's a, I don't know. See, this is our day and age today, hot and cold, Laodicea. All right, now let's look at Revelation 4, verse 1. We're going to cover some interesting deep doctrines now. Oh, yeah. And we, we did not even look at Revelation 6. Revelation 6 is when we start to unleash the tribulation. But Revelation 4 and 5, we're going to see the Christian rapture of the church and when we go up to heaven, and you're going to see some deep doctrines already in just these two chapters. Man, when we hit the tribulation, that means, whoa, this is going to be a phenomenal ride. <clears throat> but I'm sure you already enjoyed chapter 2 and chapter 3, right? You know why? Because it was about us. It was about us. We've seen our history, haven't we? So it was a great church history lesson that I hope you learned and that you know which day and age we live in now and that you can be more careful and learn the lesson from these seven churches. All right, that was fun, Revelation 2 and 3. I really enjoyed that, especially double application, right? Yeah. Spiritual application for Christian, doctrinal application for tribulation saints. Do you realize when you do double application, things become more enlightening from the scripture? becomes more amazing, more powerful.